Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to a new video. In this one, I'd like to answer a question about when we can use the Foster Nexthaler, which is an inhaler. It's a combination inhaler, just like other inhalers as well. But I think this video might be helpful if you're trying to understand how your doctor is prescribing these things, because sometimes it may not actually seem like the indication for which they've prescribed the medication is actually found on the label inside the package of the medication. So I just want to explain that a little bit, give you a bit of a nuance uh, perspective about that. So I'm just going to pull up the comment that came, uh, came on here. So, hello doctor, can we use Foster and Exhaler without having asthma? And I think that's a very common thing that happens because sometimes doctors may prescribe these sort of inhalers, like just this one or this one or some other inhaler, for another reason, not necessarily because they think you have asthma. Sometimes they may think, based on the theoretical probabilities, that this type of medication or another one may be helpful in your situation. Now, obviously, I'm not a doctor. I'm not providing medical advice here, but I'm just suggesting that potentially you may be recovering sometimes from a chest infection and you're still a little bit wheezy. You're still uh, not recovering as fast as possible. So maybe your doctor may prescribe something like this for a few months to see if that improves your situation. Or sometimes they may use this as a trial uh, of therapy. So for example, they think that you may have asthma, but they don't have all the arguments in favor of that diagnosis. So they give you one of these to try for a few months. If you feel better, that can it's in itself be uh, an argument in favor of that particular diagnosis. Now, I just wanted to show you a document that you can find online yourselves as well. So if you're looking for this, it's something called an SMPC. Now, obviously, you have the package leaflet. So the, the, that's the information that's provided inside the box th that comes with the medication. So you can look at that. That's, the, that's basically the document that you would use as a patient. It's a simplified document, but it's a summary of a much larger document, which is also the summary of an even larger document, but let's not go into that one. But basically, this is the SMPC. This is the summary of product characteristics. So this one here, this SMPC. Now, be mindful, this document is intended for use by health professionals. Now, in the SMPC is, I believe, something that's used uh, extensively in Europe. Other countries in the world may have similar things. This document may be called something slightly different in other countries of the world. However, each medication that has a marketing authorization, that means it's allowed to be sold and prescribed in a certain country, it must have a similar document such as the SMPC. Now, this is a huge document. It has a lot of information. And like I said, even this is not the full information that the company who's producing the medication submitted to the authorities in that country for approval. But it can tell you what the indications, the approved indications are for any medication. So if you look this up, most countries in the world will have a website of the national medication approving organization, basically. So in the UK, that's the MHRA. In, I don't know, in Europe-wide, in the European Union, it's the European Medicines Agency. In the United States, it might be the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. You will find these in any country of the world. You'll find these documents which are public listed. So in this complicated document, this is why it's intended for health professionals, because it contains a lot of information that's a bit scientific key, let's say, so it may be hard to understand. But you have in this section, this is at least valid in Europe. In section four, you will have therapeutic indications. And you will see here that Foster Next Taylor, so this one, uh, is approved for asthma and COPD, as you can see here. So asthma and COPD. And in it goes into a little bit more detail. So it's approved, for example, for use in COPD if it's severe COPD, so not in mild COPD. So you can see that there may be some details about the indication for use of this therapy. However, please, please bear with me for just a little bit longer. These indications do not mean that the drug doesn't necessarily work in any other situations. It doesn't mean that. What this document summarizes is the research that's been submitted by the company for approval for a marketing authorization in that country. Each medication, this one, this one, any tablet you find around the house, is approved for a very narrow use. And that's basically to control 
what people are prescribing and for what reasons and to try to have as much uh, clinical data behind it as much research data as possible behind it when we make these prescriptions that doesn't mean that the drug won't be useful for example in other indications but your doctor may choose to prescribe it for that reason that's called off-label prescribing so for example this is the label for foster and exhaler in the uk at least it's approved for asthma and copd but your doctor may actually be able to prescribe this for another reason that's off-label prescribing now obviously when we go to off-label prescribing we need to be a little bit careful and as physicians we generally do a risk-benefit assessment on a case-by-case -case basis do we think that theoretically this medication will help you in some way now for foster and exhaler which is an inhaler that contains we know what it contains so it contains beclometasone and formoterol beclometasone is a corticosteroid an inhaled corticosteroid so it controls inflammation in the airway we know that that works for a lot of theory and a lot of uh, medical knowledge that we have behind it so we may use it potentially for another reason where we may have some airway inflammation for motorol is just a bronchodilator so it just opens up the airway so this is a combination inhaler but like i said we tend to adjust how we prescribe medications based on the situation this is the best situation possible so we would only prescribe theoretically under the ideal optimal circumstances foster an exhaler only for asthma and severe copd however we may sometimes try it for other things as well but what i guess i'm trying to say with this sort of nuanced discussion which may be confusing granted is that things are not always as clear-cut and if you look at this document for example in the uk and you look up the same medication in another country you may find that the smpc has differences so the marketing authorization may actually be different in each country for this can be for a number of reasons so the company may actually submit different approval dossiers to different regulatory agencies in different countries and i think this is very interesting it's something that we, it's important to be aware of because for example the same drug that's approved in germany may be actually approved for slightly different indications in Germany compared to France or compared to the United Kingdom or the United States. And this is just how uh, the company decided to promote that product and put it on the market in that specific country. Uh, so this is a very interesting sort of domain. And I think as a patient, you may be lost in these indications. You may sometimes read about some new revolutionary medication that's approved in one country, but not in another even though the drug may actually work now there is something to do with reimbursement as well because if you can imagine some of these medications can become quite costly for a health system so if the health system cannot really sustain basically um, some of these medications they may be available for prescription but the health system may not reimburse them so your doctor may actually not be able to prescribe a certain medication and may have to opt for another equivalent medication or something else because of limitations around prescribing so for example if you prescribe the medication off-label it may be that you are able to prescribe it because it is approved but the state will not reimburse the cost so it's something that's a little bit complicated it's a little bit tricky now as a health provider myself as a doctor i always try to refer to these sort of documents the smpc documents for the different medications that I work with because they contain a lot of information. And like I said, these are public documents. You can find them yourself. You can look, look them up. You can discuss the information contained in it with your doctor, but it's be wary that it's very scientific and it may sometimes be a little bit hard to understand and confusing. So that's why the label inside the package leaflet the thing that is provided in the box with the medication is your go-to as a patient as a doctor i need to know more when i'm prescribing a medication i need to know more details about how the side effects have been reported and what population this drug was researched and i can find some of these um, informations uh, some, some of these bits of information in this sort of document so I hope this wasn't very, very confusing, but I wanted to provide a bit of a nuanced view on how medications are prescribed because that comment was very good because sometimes you are confused as a patient, I believe, 
when your doctor prescribes you something but it doesn't really match the leaflet in the box. Uh, this is why. I hope this was a clear enough explanation as to why that is and how medication prescribing can differ from country to country and how it may evolve over time. So this document that I showed you before, the SNPC, can evolve. So it gets updated regularly. As the company finds new information about the drug, for example, they find out that this medication potentially might work in bronchiectasis, let's say. This is theoretically, it's not necessarily the case, but let's say they find uh, that studies have shown that this is what it does. It works in another indication. They will apply for approval for another indication if the regulatory authorities decide that, yes, that's, that's true, it works. They've looked at the data from the company and they agree that there is enough data to support that indication. They will be given another therapeutic indication that will be added to this document and doctors will then be able to prescribe it in a reimbursed fashion potentially for that new indication. So it's a complex process in the pharmaceutical industry and how it interacts with the regulatory agencies and how the patients sort of end only get to see the end result of that interaction. But I find it relatively interesting. If you found this video helpful, do leave more questions in the comments below. I'll try to answer as much as possible and clarify things for you as much as I can. But like I said, I'm not your doctor. So always check with your doctor why you're prescribed the medication. I think that's the, the key. If you know why you've been given a medication, what's the rationale behind your doctor's decision to recommend that specific medication over another, I think you'll be in a much better position to control whatever condition you are having. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you in future videos. All the best.